Okay, so continuing on with our suspension setup on this car. Um, right now, I am, uh, after test driving, I've found a few things I wanted to address on this car. Um, for those of you who don't recall, I'm running a very vintage tire and wheel combination on my car. Obviously, I'm running a paint scheme that doesn't really add up by today's you know, looks and feels of a car. This is all very vintage feeling. So, with that said, now that we got our uh, upgraded four pot brakes from Alcoholics on here with the slotted and vented rotors, and we have our now adjustable upper A arms, um, the caster and camber need to be addressed because the wheel on this thing is pretty big, and I want to make sure I have all the clearance I need to this front fender. I have all the clearance I need up here, I have all the clearance I need back here, but now under heavy braking and turning in, I become very close to this front fender. And if you think about it, the tire is rotating this way. There's a fold right here. It's not inconceivable for that tire to grab this and pull it down and just destroy the front end of this car. So we're going to have to create a little bit of space there. Okay. So most race cars run somewhere between one, one and a quarter, one and a half, maybe even all the way up to two degrees of negative camber. That's pretty huge on the negative camber. That's really bringing that tire inbound. For those of you that that's a bit of a mystery, negative camber brings the top of the tire towards the inner fender. Positive camber takes the top of the tire and pushes it out. Okay. Um, in a race application, we tend to prefer to have a little bit of negative camber. It helps the car hook up rather well under heavy turning conditions. Okay. So in this case, um, I have a very tall profile tire, meaning the sidewall is huge. Um, I can put easily one, one quarter degrees of negative camber and still have full contact patch on the bottom. In other words, where the tire meets the ground, I should still have plenty of full tread meeting, meeting contact to the, to the ground. Um, lower profile tires that are, tend to be on, you know, fairly wide rims, you know, like a six, seven, you know, even eight inch rim. If it's a low profile tire, that camber can somewhat exaggerate the contact patch of the tire to the ground. Um, that's just something to know, okay? Um, we won't get into the science of that just yet, but that is coming up. We have a couple of big race events that we're, uh, we're tech supporting on that maybe we can use some of that video and explain that. But for now, what I'm trying to do is I'm gonna take the upper control off. I'm gonna take the, the uh, caster and the camber mechanism out, recenter my caster arm because I have almost all the thread exposed here and very little thread exposed in the front. So this wasn't centered before I put it on, my error. Um, and I'm going to adjust the camber. Now I have a, a tool that tells me how many degrees of camber I have in the car, so I'll be able to show you what that's like. I've already set up the other side, so I need this side to mimic that side. I have uh, one and 1.25 degrees of camber, negative camber on that side, and I have 40 millimeters of space from right here to the tire. So we have no rub issues over there whatsoever. This side becomes alarmingly close to rub on turn in, so we got to address that. And that's what we're going to focus on today. It just occurred to me that I probably didn't explain why I was doing all this in the first place. Um, basically, what I have is, and now that it's almost done, I'm going to just take it out. Okay, again, the caster arm. You can see that very little thread here has been used, but a substantial amount of thread here has been used. So I need to recenter this before I put it back in and make sure it's, you know, reasonable. But the primary reason why we're going through all this is because when I was trying to get the, the uh, camber pulled in on this side, my adjustable camber arm wasn't being too cooperative. So I think what we're gonna end up having to do is we're gonna have to take it out, clean all the threading, and see why it's being so resistant to adjusting in. So let me get it out and see what we can do about that. There we go, so now it's out. Now I need to find out why it's being so resistant. So we're gonna tear it down and take a look at it. All right, so this is the side with the ball joint. This is the side that sits on top of the upper spindle. So 
that side seems to be threading just fine. What the problem is, is the side that goes towards the inner fender. Excuse my dog. That's Otis the Great Dane. He's a bit of a shop dog on the weekends. Anyway, so Otis and I are going to try to figure out what's going on with this. Okay. What I think about it is, is the nuts on the adjustments, the nuts on the inner and the outer, they are 24 millimeter. This center nut is actually uh, a one inch or a, a 25 millimeter, so I need to get that on there. Okay, so the uh, the outer, which connects to the top of the spindle, is doing fine. Um, that threading was real clean, and there's no problems there, but I can't get any adjustment of it feeding in uh, to create that negative camber. So what you're gonna need is 24 millimeter for the outer nut, and the center nut's actually 25 millimeter. So once you get that tension off of there, you should be able to, in theory, get it off. Just about now you can see my dilemma. Okay, so I'm gonna take it over to the vice and get this cleaned up. Did the job than I thought. Okay, so we're gonna to try to wrap up this whole front suspension pros and cons thing, maybe over this particular episode, or maybe one more after this, depending on how all this gets edited. Um, but this is where we're at. About a month, month and a half ago, uh, we started to explore the concept of some of the tunability you can get out of the front end of your car. And what we were talking about was being able to control the camber and caster in certain situations which would improve your car's trackability. When I say trackability, I don't mean straight line trackability. I mean if you wanted to take your car to the local track and just get a real sense of what it can perform like, you know, there's fine little nuances you can do to really change the characteristics of how it handles. Um, so on my car, I had a set of used but in very good shape, or so I thought, uh, upper control arms, adjustable upper control arms, often called GTA upper control arms. Um, now the standard upper control arm is not really adjustable on a GTV, but the adjustable upper control arms, which you can now buy, um, is what we had on here. They were used and what had happened was is I adjusted the, the camber and I'll show you what that's all about in a little bit. I adjusted the camber on my car and I was able to get, because I was looking for about 1.25 camber on my car, uh, that would be negative camber and we'll, we'll talk about that again in a little bit. But anyway, so I got the 1.25 adjustability out of the passenger side, but I couldn't, for whatever reason, seem to get the driver's side to move in. It would move out, but it wouldn't move in. So I was stuck at literally um, positive 0.75 camber, which is a really bad situation. So when I started to wrench on it pretty good, now I, I'm probably a fairly strong guy, but I'm not super strong. Uh, when I started to wrench on the upper troll arm, I noticed that it just like hit a dead spot where it wouldn't go past. So I had no choice but to take it off. When I took it off, and this is it, took it off, found out that one side of it was broke off inside the arm. Now, I gotta believe this is an exceptionally rare situation. I've never seen one of these broke, so I don't think this is something anybody should get alarmed about, but that's what I had. Um, so, 
there's pros and cons to using new stuff. We are using it simply for exploratory options and to get some uh, tutorials going on best ways to set up a car. And uh, I'm glad this was on my car um, because I would have never known. Um, but this is why we don't particularly use use suspension parts or anything that's relevant to safety on a car on customers' cars. Because if you don't know the history of it, you can't guarantee the car is going to be safe. So this is a fine example of that. Anyhow, so this is the used one that was broke, which is why I couldn't get my negative camber that I was looking for. So we ordered up a new set. I have one on where this was, and I'm going to replace this one today. Right now it is 9.30 in the morning on Saturday. And we're going to do a lot of stuff today, so we'll see how long we can go. But here's our new... Um, replacement unit for the passenger side because obviously now I have no confidence in the used product I'll be darned if I'm gonna put them on my car so I'm gonna take the other one off which wasn't bad but we're taking it off anyway now something to note if you were to use use adjustable control arms the ball side of this that's not really replaceable so if this is wore out you're just better off going to buy new ones they're not that expensive um, I guess somebody in a specialty field could potentially rebuild the, uh, the ball side of it. I mean, the bushings on here and here, this is where it goes into the actual cross member socket. And this one connects to the caster arm, which we'll talk about more later. Um, those are rebuildable, but this really isn't. So if somebody's offering you a set and the reasonable monies, get to moving this. If this is real sloppy, walk away. It's not worth it. Okay, so anyway, we're going to change out the passenger side one, and we'll get started on that now. Oh, but before we do, I want to show you the tools you kind of need to have in order to control your caster. Okay, this is critical, so I'll go get it right now. Now, we're using a 14-inch rim, so this is cut to sit in the bead of our 14 inch rim perfectly, okay? This is a very true piece of square tubing, so I trust that this measurements can be accurate. And then I also use, and these are actually fairly cheap and probably not a bad idea to own one. Um, this is a digital mag protractor, okay? So basically what I do is I take this, connect it to that, it's magnetic, power it up, and I put it up against the rim. And again, I'll show you later what that's all about. Put it up against the rim, once I know that the car is settled into its perfectly drivability stance, then I adjust, and because this reads in 0.05 increments, I can get very, very accurate with how the camber is on my car. So I'll show you what this is all about later. But uh, you can get one of these digital, high quality uh, digital mags. You can get one of these for probably about 75, 80 bucks. Um, if you're only going to adjust the car one time, probably better off taking it to somebody um, but if you think you're gonna play with the tunability of your car a lot it might not be a bad idea to have one of these show you what's going on now. okay I wanted to backtrack a little bit and make sure that because um, I'm not really sure how the video is going to be edited up at this point um, I wanted to give you a good understanding of where we were and what was going on um, this piece right here this is the camber arm okay this is the piece that broke on me all right again i don't think that would be probable to happen ever again it's that that's so rare as long as i've been doing this i've never seen one of those break ever all right so anyhow um so you cannot adjust camber with the car sitting like this on jack with wheel off it has to be in its fully relaxed ride stance all right. So even if I put the wheel back on and lower the car back down, it's not a ride stance at that point. The car has to be moved around and settled into its position. At that point, then you can actually adjust this. Um, reason is, is because the car's characteristics can be all sorts of different. Because right now, the wheel would naturally want to swing this way because the arms drop down. Okay. So once it sits back down the wheel and the wheel's on the ground, it still has probably a little bit of positive camber at that point. That's why you have to move back and forth to get the wheel to kind of kick back in and be relaxed where it would normally be if you're on the road. All right, so again, um, we're going to replace the camber on the other side simply because we have two brand new ones now. And then we're going to focus on the value of adjusting the caster. Maybe not in this episode, maybe later, I'm not really sure. 
Um, but the focus of this conversation right now is justifying when to correct your your um, your camber. In my case, because I have such a large profile tire, because I'm running a vintage series uh, tire. Um, I can get away with running a little bit of uh, camber, meaning negative camber, okay? So I'm going to run 1.25 camber. That's actually quite a bit. Um, full dress race cars run, depending on how they're set up and depending on what kind of wheels are on them and tires. Um, they can range anywhere from zero to maybe even up to, I've heard a crazy number is three degrees of negative camber. That, that's, that's pretty strong. Um, most cars, especially if you have this great Alphaholics Geo kit and, and everything that they offer, you know, one, one and a quarter, one and a half, maybe is about as much as you would go. Um, you can consult with them what they find to be um, best on their setups, but uh, on all the race cars we prepped and put all of this product on, we found that 125 to 1 1.5 is about it about max okay um, but anyhow so let's go ahead and get started on what we're doing here okay a little bit of disclaimer time getting the cross member pins out is exactly uh, it's not a hard job but they're pretty difficult to get to if your battery is located in the front of your car be careful about that. You might want to disconnect it because you can come very close to the high voltage wiring in order to get to these pins. And on this side, if you have an early car, you have your fuel filter up here, you have fuel lines up here, the bottom of the carbs are up here. Be careful of all that. Um, and use the minimal amount of force you need to get these out. Now the thing of it is, is I've already taken these out a few times now over the last six, seven months. So these are going to come apart for me pretty easily. Um, but I have a jack sitting underneath the bottom of the uh, spindle to support it because once I pull this upper control arm out, that thing's going to want to fall. The spring's there. It, it's a potentially dangerous situation is what I'm saying. So you want to support the, the cross, or the, uh, you want to support the spindle and everything in this area because you've got brake lines there. You don't want to stress them. And so as you can see, I have a jack here holding the spindle in place. So once I take that upper control arm off, this thing's going to fall away this way. So um, we're just going to get to it. All right, I pushed the pin out, the bolt's off. And yeah, I do understand that I have the luxury of a lift here, but this is something you can achieve in your own driveway. It's just going to take time. We started in on this at approximately about 9.30. It's now 10.25, so you know, um, I have a lift. It takes a while. Don't get frustrated. It's going to take you a long time. Um, I would say you definitely have to dedicate the better half of your day to do this. Um, so if you got a kid's soccer game or something to go to, that's not the weekend you want to try this. Alright, so everything is loose and ready to go. Now I realize this is a tool that most people wouldn't have. It's actually an air hammer with a pickle fork attachment to it. If you tear apart enough suspensions, you really should think about getting one of these. Makes everything a breeze. Now again, we've already taken this apart a few times. It's only going to take one or two pops and this thing's going to fly right off. Um, I always leave the bolt on the ball joint um, just for safety purposes. You don't want everything necessarily blowing apart and you're not prepared to accept that. So. And it's done. Now we're ready to take this thing apart. Okay, so now that everything's ready to come off, um, again, I can't emphasize the importance of this jack being here to hold the lower section of this car together. Um, so now I'm going to take the old adjustable upper arm off and what we're going to do is we're going to match it up to the new one and make sure that they're relatively in the same ballpark before we put it in that way when I have to fine tune it it'll be a little closer and I'm not starting from a greater distance to get it balanced in anyhow so we take the caster arm off it's still here just it's out of the way 
Here's the old adjustable upper arm. And now I'm going to pair it up with the brand new one and make sure that they're relatively same exact distance apart from here to here, center of this. And then we'll put it back in, or put the new one in, I should say. And uh, we'll dial in the, the, the camber on this, and that should be it for that. All right, let's get going. Okay, so here we are with our old one, and here we are with the new one. So, as you can see, they're not exactly lined up to the same height. The new one is a fair amount shorter. So making sure that you're distributing the threads equally away from one another, um, we're gonna back them out to match the length that we need. All right, so there's that. So the ideal way of doing this is keeping both the front and back of the arm stable in one place and loosening up the lock nuts and just back it out until it meets what you expect it to meet. I'm keeping this and this effectively about the same location, just letting the back part, the part that receives into the uh, cross member, allowing it to just back down. Okay, and I'm also paying attention that my threading on both sides of the adjustment are equally backing out. Okay, so that's that's, uh, that's pretty doggone close. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just bring the nuts back out to the points where they're close enough that they don't move. Okay. It's kinda locked down, if you will. And now we'll put the new one in. It's just that simple. Okay, as you can see from our digital mini mag, we're at 1.65 uh, negative degrees of camber. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust it and bring it into about one, maybe a one and a quarter at the most. Um, we're just going to get it close for now. We'll fine tune it later. Um, but the point is, this is just an exercise to show you as to how to adjust the um, the, the camber on the car um, and really you can't do it by sight you really need something that can appropriately measure it now the steel beam you see resting up against the rim we confirmed that it's completely square and we know that it's absolutely proper and it, we cut it to fit just the inside of the bead of the rim so it doesn't have a whole lot of room to move around and so now our tool works very effectively we've uh, tested this many times to confirm that it was good and it is so now I'm going to adjust it a little bit more. Um, you need a 25 millimeter or a one inch uh, wrench to actually adjust it. Um, the outer locking nuts are 24 millimeter, but the inner nut um, is a 25 or a one inch. So now I'm gonna adjust it a little bit. Because we're so close up, um, it's gonna probably be difficult for you to see what I'm doing. So I'll back the camera up so you can see. All right, so more or less that's there. See it's starting to move. So this is the nut we're adjusting right here, okay? Um, it's, there's the locking nut, the center, and the opposing locking nut. So we're focusing on just the uh, center nut because the two outers are already loose. Okay, after adjusting it, you can see that we're sitting at 1.25. That matches the driver's side of the car. So we'll lock them down from here, and 
we'll see how our trackability is and our turn in ability and get a sense of where we're going from there but I'm not really a big fan of getting any more than that out of a car that's really primary purpose is street ability uh, it will see some track efforts but nothing in a competitive fashion it's just gonna be something to shake the car down and have fun with so uh, my recommendation is if you're gonna do something like this I really don't see a reason why one would ever go past uh, one and a half degrees of negative camber um, because it's all about the footprint of the tire and the contact patch you need to have lots of contact patch for the full grip ability of the car